I will now discuss the concept of a cyclic prefix in OFDM modulation in order to combat intersymbol interference. The fact that OFDM symbols are created through the process of an inverse uh, discrete Fourier transform or inverse FFT leads to the concept of using a cyclic prefix in order to uh, combat intersymbol interference and results in a reduction in complexity which is quite significant compared to equalization in the time domain using, for example, decision feedback equalizers. In order to see how the concept of a cyclic prefix works, let's review the process of generating an OFDM symbol. As we have mentioned before, 64 carriers uh, in the frequency domain are collected, and the inverse FFT is computed, mapping them back into the time domain. Each carrier represents a component in the time domain, a sinusoid, with a frequency that are spaced apart at delta F equals uh, 312.5 kilohertz. The duration of each OFDM symbol, uh, in our case for 11A, for example, was 3.2 microseconds. And of course, 1 over 3.2 microseconds corresponds to 312.5 kilohertz, which is a carrier spacing. So the carrier spacing is the inverse of the length of the OFDM symbol, or the duration of the OFDM symbol T. In the case of uh, 802.11a, we mentioned that the FFT size was 64 samples, so the inverse FFT was uh, 64 samples. So in the time domain, each OFDM symbol uh, consists of 64 samples and is a superposition of multiple sinusoids separated at delta F, of course. In order to proceed, it is interesting to note that if you took an OFDM symbol and you constructed the time record I show over here where we have the original uh, OFDM symbol and we attach another, the same, we copy the same OFDM symbol to the right and the same OFDM symbol to the left, we create actually a periodic signal uh, with period T where the symbol is repeated. In fact, the discrete Fourier transform can be thought of as uh, consisting of a Fourier series transform on a periodic signal which is made periodic by the time limited time record you make it periodic and you get a periodic signal and then of course you can compute the Fourier series and you can relate the discrete Fourier transform to the to the Fourier series in this way and the the important thing I want to point out is the fact that if we do construct a single in this fashion then the adjacent signal, uh, adjacent symbol in this case, is going to be continuous. That is, we, the signal going from here to here is continuous, and we'll show that in a minute. This is a property of the DFT and the inverse DFT. The fact that the uh, samples are, in fact, cyclically, have a cyclic nature to them, and this is one of the basis of the cyclic prefix concept and how we can use it in order to combat into symbol interference. So if we here we're showing the OFDM symbol which is uh, 64 samples long. Uh, here it's shown in time, it's 3.2 microseconds. And here we're showing it in the time domain. So this is the OFDM symbol. We've actually separated out the, uh, the carriers. And of course uh, the OFDM symbol is, a super, is the addition of all these carriers. Now what I'm showing here is the fact that, and as I mentioned before, if we took this symbol and copied it over here and made it periodic, then it would be continuous in the sense that, uh, and we're going to exploit that. So if you take, for example, the last 16 samples of our OFDM symbol, which is the uh, result of the inverse FFT of the carriers, if you took the last 16 samples and move them, copy them to the beginning and formed another uh, symbol which is now actually 80 samples long. So you have uh, 64 samples here. You take the last 16 samples and then copy them and attach them to the beginning and now you have 80 samples. What this figure shows very importantly is the fact that it is continuous over here. So, so if you look at the signal the OFDM single, and then here we're exploiting the cyclic nature. 
if you look at this and we attach this right at the beginning then we we have a continuous signal here this is due to the, na the cyclic nature of the uh, FFT and the DFT in fact very important that this this applies to the whole OFDM signal every single carrier would be continuous so if I copy this over here then it's continuous in terms of its attachment to the remainder of the symbol this is a cyclic nature of the FFT coming into play now what's important about this uh, cyclic prefix it's going to act as a guard interval in terms of when you have inter symbol interference and we'll show this in a minute but we we also want to show that if you do form a symbol and actually transmit the this symbol that is you take the last 16 samples copy them and attach them to the beginning then and you transmit this symbol rather than the 64 samples you transmit the 80 samples with the cyclic prefix attached then there is no discontinuity due to this operation everything is continuous of course this is very important in terms of its impact on the spectrum uh, so there will be no impact on the spectrum the signal is still continuous and again because of the cyclic nature at the receiver uh, it doesn't matter whether I receive this this signal from here to here or for example from here let's take a look from here to here when you compute the FFT all you're introducing is a time offset which can be corrected during equalization but you can recover the signal so you can tolerate timing ambiguity within the guard interval of course there are consequences when you have multipath and intersymbol interference that we, we will get into let's take a look at the uh, impulse response uh, this is the in-phase impulse response for a channel with a uh, RMS delay spread of 150 nanoseconds of course you'll have impulse impulses and exceeding even 800 nanoseconds so let's go back over here when we're talking about 16 samples we're talking about 16 samples at a sampling rate of 20 megahertz at a sampling rate of 20 megahertz the interval between samples is 1 over 20 megahertz or 50 nanoseconds so if I take 16 samples I have 16 times 50 nanoseconds or 800 nanoseconds so the size of the cyclic prefix in our case for 802.11a is 800 nanoseconds so here we're taking the case where you have a multipath channel with RMS delay spread of 150 nanoseconds and obviously with an RMS delay spread of 150 nanoseconds the actual delays uh, the excess delay exceeds that by a uh, factor of say 5 and exceeds in fact 800 nanoseconds so the red line here shows uh, the mark where we have 800 nanoseconds and you notice that the multipath impulse response goes beyond the 800 nanoseconds so even for 150 nanosecond RMS delay spread we do have the case where the impulse response exceeds 800 nanoseconds now if the RMS delay spread was like 50 nanoseconds then of course the impulse response would have died out before 800 nanoseconds now this impulse response of the multipath channel of course causes inter symbol interference because when I put for each particular symbol if you consider it as an impulse it will produce this uh, impulse response its energy would then leak into the adjacent to symbol so for example if I take OFDM symbols and put them right after each other there is no immunity to inter symbol interference each symbol will interfere or spill into the adjacent uh, symbol we'll show that in a minute but for now consider the fact that 16 samples cyclic prefix attached to the original symbol creating a new symbol which is 80 samples wide or 4 microseconds in length has a guard interval or a cyclic, pre cyclic prefix which is 800 nanoseconds now here's what happens if we send uh, and this is time if we send OFDM symbols right after each other and we each OFDM symbol has this guard interval which we've shown over here then at the receiver uh, what we do is we basically take the OFDM symbol and identify the guard interval toss it out throw it away and take the uh, 64 samples that were created through the inverse FFT process of course now it's gone through the multipath channel and so forth but we take the 64 samples and compute the FFT and recover the carriers and of course 
do the whole demodulation process. So at the receiver, it's very simple. We take we take each OFDM symbol, take the garden interval, and throw it away, and just use the FFT of the 64 samples to demodulate the signal. Now, why does this help us in combating inter-symbol interference? Here we show the fact that if, if we consider this symbol, which has gone through a multipath channel, then of course, due to the multipath impulse response of the multipath channel, the symbol would actually leak or spread into the adjacent symbol. And we sort of show this with this tapering going on over here. And the amount of spillage of this symbol into it, the next symbol depends on the, the delay spread, the RMS delay spread of the multipath channel. Here we're showing the case where the RMS delay spread is about 150 nanoseconds. Signal spills into the guard interval, and some of it uh, spills beyond the guard interval into the symbol, creating inter-symbol interference. But the bulk of the inter-symbol interference energy is within this guard interval. So at the receiver, in order to combat inter-symbol interference, all I do is, is I take this guard interval and just toss it out, and I'm left with the 64 samples for the OFTM symbol with minimum amount of inter-symbol interference shown over here. And as the channel, if it has, for example, uh, less RMS uh, delay spread, then this will taper out like this and you'd have act actually no inter-symbol interference. And this way we eliminated inter-symbol interference uh, in this fashion. Now this doesn't come for free. So although we've managed to reduce the complexity in terms of the receiver equalization process by adding the guard interval or cyclic prefix, the fact is that the cyclic prefix does not add any more information. That is, the information content is the same, yet we're taking a fixed amount of information which already exists and we're attaching it to the beginning of the symbol, yet the transmitter is transmitting this whole symbol, including the guard interval, which, which you can think of as carrying no additional information. So we actually have a loss in the signal-to-noise ratio because of the addition of the guard interval. So it doesn't come for free, and that loss in signal-to-noise ratio uh, can be computed uh, through this expression. And obviously, the larger the guard interval, the more we lose in terms of uh, effective SNR. This is sort of like an AM modulation where you use uh, the carrier exists, which bears no information whatsoever, but of course simplifies the demodulation of an AM modulated waveform. Here we're showing the uh, actual modulation and demodulation process, of course, uh, simplified. We're ignoring uh, acquisition, packet detection, etc. So basically, we're generating data, mapping them to the uh, QPSK constellation and collecting the complex uh, numbers associated with each constellation point into carriers, grouping them into 64 carriers, of course adding the guard interval and so forth, and zero at DC. We perform the inverse uh, endpoint FFT. We get the symbol in the time domain, the OFTM symbol in the time domain, which consists of 64 complex samples corresponding to 3.2 microseconds. We add the cyclic prefix so now we have a symbol which is now 4 microseconds, or 80 samples. We modulate that, send it through the multipath channel. Of course, we have additive noise. We demodulate the signal. We receive the OFTM symbol with a cyclic prefix, 4 microseconds total, or 80 samples. And, and this block, of course, we're assuming perfect timing recovery at this point, and uh, acquisition. Uh, at this point, we have a block which uh, removes the cyclic prefix, just tosses it, throws it away. And we have the OFDM symbols, 64 samples. We perform a forward FFT. We recover our carriers in the frequency domain. We do what you call a per carrier equalization, which we'll get into. Of course, this is, this is the fact that we're actually using two training symbols to estimate the channel frequency response. And here we multiply it times the inverse of the channel frequency response and equalize the carriers. And then we go through the, of course, QPSK mapper and so forth and recover the original bits, not shown. Sure. So this is, uh, this is how we use cyclic prefix in order to combat inter-symbol interference. And uh, basically, we add a cyclic prefix at the transmitter. And of course, we toss it, throw it away at the receiver, and uh, recover the uh, original carriers 
with minimum intersymbol interference. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of intersymbol interference and with a cyclic prefix with various RMS delay spreads. These are actually based on capsule simulations of uh, the OFDM system. Here we're showing the case where we have 50 nanosecond RMS delay spread channel. And this is the demodulated constellation for 54 megabits per second, 64 QAM. Here's the in-phase component, the quadrature phase component. So basically what's happening for a channel with a 50 nanosecond uh, RMS delay spread is uh, illustrated in this figure hit right here. Where we show two o OFDM symbols. This OFDM symbol, due to the 50 nanosecond uh, RMS delay spread, does spill over into the uh, next symbol. But because the delay spread is, uh, is small, 50 nanoseconds, the intersymbol interference dies off within the guard interval. So at the receiver, when we throw away this guard interval, uh, actually there's no intersymbol interference uh, energy at all within the, uh, the next symbol. And we see that in the constellation. So you see that the constellation points have very little error. However, in the case where the channel, multipath fading channel, has a RMS delay spread of uh, 200 nanoseconds, then of course we have a lot of excess delay and that spills over to the next symbol. So here we have the symbol actually, the energy from the symbol spilling over, extending into the next symbol beyond the guard interval. So at the receiver, even though we toss out uh, the bulk of the inter symbol interference, there is a residual intersymbol interference, and that, of course, creates errors in the constellation, and that shows up here in this picture where you see that, unlike the case where we had an RMS delay spread of 50 nanoseconds, for the case where we have an RMS delay spread of 200 nanoseconds, uh, we have errors in the constellation, as you can see. Now, at uh, high data rates like 54 megabits per second, this shows that uh, when you have uh, multipath fading, uh, that is going to be very detrimental to high-speed communications because at 54 megabits per second, the excess delay, the intersymbol interference, will cause errors in the demodulation decoding process, especially when you consider the fact that uh, you, when you add noise and uh, also other distortions uh, to the system. So you're less immune to noise and other distortions within the system at high data rates in a multipath fading channel with a large RMS delay spread, which is expected. Here we show the constellation with a RMS delay spread of 150 nanoseconds, and of course it has less error than the case of 200 nanosecond RMS delay spread. But what we want to show is a, as a method to characterize and measure the amount of error introduced by intersymbol interference uh, within the constellation. So we're going to talk about error vector magnitude, or EVM. Here we show the case where we have, for example, QPSK. So we have four points, four constellation points, and here we show the ideal constellation points. But what we receive are actual constellation points that are not exactly, they don't exactly fall on the ideal, and due to intersymbol interference, distortion, noise, etc., they would actually fall within a region around the ideal uh, constellation point. In fact, sometimes they might even fall within this region here and be incorrectly decoded as this uh, a constellation point. For now, consider the case where the errors are, are such that the constellation points are around uh, the ideal here. So due to intersymbol interference, uh, the received constellation points will be like a cloud around the ideal point. Now consider the measured uh, constellation, received constellation point due to ISI or other distortions is received at this point then this is actually the magnitude of the vector of the measured constellation point. And this is, of course, a vector corresponding to the ideal constellation point. Of course, the error vector is shown over here between the measured and the ideal. So the EVM is calculated by actually averaging, computing the square of the error vectors shown over here. So if you take the measured minus the ideal, and measure its magnitude and square it, that's the error vector squared, and we sum them for all the received symbols. So n 
the number n here represents all the received symbols so we sum all the errors square of the errors over all the received symbols we divide by the number of symbols so we, we get the average and then we normalize by the power the actually we normalize by the uh, average energy of the ideal constellation shown over here so we take the ideal constellation square it add it up for all the number of constellation points in this case m equals four in this case m equals sixty four so we uh, average that over the number of points in the constellation and we normalize the measured uh, square of the error vector averaged and we come up with the EVM the EVM is usually computed in terms of db so we actually take 10 log base 10 of uh, this quantity here and we obtain the EVM in dbs uh, this plot is very interesting uh, so over a large number of simulations what we've done is we've taken uh, an ensemble of uh, multipath fading channels with different uh, rms delay spreads and computed the EVM at the receiver for the various delay spreads and the EVM is computed in terms of dBs and you'll notice that uh, as we decrease the RMS delay spread of the channel the intersymbol interference is small and the excess delay uh, does not you know the intersymbol interference doesn't spill over into the next symbol by throwing away the garden it will basically eliminate it and the EVM is small and the errors around the computed EVM are small however as we increase the channels RMS delay spread we see that the uh, EVM starts to increase and also there's a quite a bit of variation among channels at, at that particular uh, EVM so we see that as the delay RMS delay spread of the channel increases the EVM distortion increases quite a bit and the EVM uh, error grows substantially. In an ideal case, of course, the EVM would be extremely small. So this shows that, in fact, the uh, even though we have cyclic prefix uh, in OFDM, there is some residual uh, intersymbol interference uh, with channels with delay spreads, RMS delay spreads beyond uh, 100 nanoseconds. You have to consider that in the link budget, uh, for example, in computing the packet error rate for cases where you have multipath fading channels. One of the nice aspects of the cyclic prefix, besides protecting against intersymbol interference due to multipath fading channels, is that it provides a tolerance for timing error in synchronization of OFDM systems during acquisition. In particular, during timing acquisition, we need to determine the boundary here in order to extract the useful signal from the OFDM symbol and then as we mentioned we discard the guard interval uh, throw away the guard interval the cyclic prefix and we have the useful part which may for example for 802.11a be 64 samples and we discard the 16 sample guard interval and we take the forward FFT to recover the constellation points and well, of course we have to equalize them now the issue is that it is very difficult to achieve perfect timing recovery and synchronization right on this boundary here. We may have an error, especially when we have multipath fitting, such that we actually determine the boundary to be at this position here, then we would have a timing error. And what we'll show in this picture here is that with the cyclic prefix uh, that is not an issue as long as the timing error is within the cyclic prefix we can uh, actually recover the signal with no no problem at all the issue becomes a factor when you have large RMS delay spreads in which case as we'll show the timing error can't be too large it has to be a small percentage of the cyclic prefix to show this, consider the cyclic prefix operation shown over here where we have the time record for the tones and here we're only showing four tones that as we know are added to each other and each tone represents a carrier so this forms an OFDM symbol 
and the cyclic prefix we took the 16 last samples and copied them and prefixed them to the symbol itself to form the OFDM symbol this part here which was called the useful part or the data part and we add the cyclic prefix which was T sub G so the total symbol time was T sub G plus T sub B now suppose we had a timing error such that instead of determining the boundary right at this point here we actually determined the boundary at this point then we would take the symbol to be this part here shown here so this is TG plus TB which is the same as from here to here but we have a timing error so we would we would assume that the boundary is here and adding 80 samples this would form our OFDM symbol and we have the timing error now if we take a close look at this we see that without getting involved in the mathematics that no information is lost by introducing this timing error if we have the cyclic prefix if you take a look at this tone over here notice that if we have the timing error then we're going to throw away this part and we're going to throw away this part over here however this part is contained in this portion here as you can see this part right here is contained that we've discarded is contained in the portion that we keep even though we have the timing error so we see that even though we have a timing error there is no loss of information let's take a look at this tone over here we lose this part because we, we throw that away we lose this part but actually that that is contained over here we lose this part because it's not within the portion that we keep but this part is included in this part even though we have the timing error it's included here so all the information is still included in this portion here the 80 samples you can also see that over here although we discard this part here it's actually contained here we discard this part but it's actually contained here so there's no loss of information in fact the timing offset error we can show that it is equivalent to a phase error in the frequency domain and is easily compensated for during the equalization process so the equalizer would treat a timing error as a phase error and compensate accordingly and we, we will show that in simulations later on so the cyclic prefix has an added bonus in the sense that it allows us to have a tolerance in terms of timing error during synchronization and this is very important because when you have multipath fading channels it is sometimes difficult to exactly synchronize on the boundary over here and you might have a offset and this shows that even though you have the offset you have no loss of information and you can uh, recover the signal during the FFT and equalization process now there's another side to this and that is that if we have large multipath fading channels with a large delay spread then if the timing error is large then we are actually allowing in more intersymbol interference so uh, we sort of have the situation that if you have a large RMS delay spread that causes intersymbol interference that also is one of the reasons that you have trouble achieving perfect timing at the boundary but then you will have a timing error so you have to during the acquisition and synchronization part uh, even with multipath fading channels you have to do a good job in terms of determining the boundary of the symbol in order to reduce the timing error and we'll get into that when we talk about synchronization during acquisition the fact that we have a tolerance to timing error because of this addition of the cyclic prefix comes in handy in OFDMA systems and in OFDM especially if you look at uh, OFDM in 802.16D or in WiMAX with 256.point FFT during the uplink the multiple uh, subscribers that send their packets back their data bursts back during the uplink we can actually tolerate a timing error because of the tolerance to timing error due to the cyclic prefix so that'll come in handy later on when we talk about WiMAX and 802.16A and D. 
Although adding a cyclic prefix and creating an OFDM symbol with a cyclic prefix provides immunity to multipath fading and intersymbol interference, however, it does come at a cost. As we add the cyclic prefix to the overall OFDM symbol, if we look at the OFDM symbol with the cyclic prefix, we have the portion which is the useful information that carries actual information in the guard interval or cyclic prefix which does not add any more information and it increases the OFDM symbol time. Now if you consider the fact that each OFDM symbol carries a certain amount of data then the bit rate is equal to the amount of data carried in the OFDM symbol divided by the symbol time or T sub s. So let's take a look at this expression over here. The data rate is equal to the number of data bits carried in the OFDM symbol divided by the duration of the OFDM symbol and that determines the actual data rate. Now let's take a look at the expression for the actual amount of data carried by each OFDM symbol. Each OFDM symbol is a result of the inverse fast Fourier transform of carriers in the case of 802.11a, for example, we have 64 carriers. Of these 64 carriers, 48 carriers actually carry data for our pilots. And then we have the nulls for the guard interval and a null at DC. So of the 64 carriers, 48 carriers carry data. That's, that's the number of n's of data over here. So each OFDM symbol carries n's of data carriers with data each carrier is a point in the constellation and each point in the constellation has b sub m number of bits associated with the point in the constellation. So for example for 64 QAM then each point in the constellation represents six bits. So if we take the number of carriers in each OFDM symbol times the number of bits per carrier then that determines the number of coded bits. Now in most OFDM systems in particular, for example, in 802.11a, we have convolutional encoding at the transmitter where we add redundancy in order to provide forward error correction coding. In 802.16d, for example, or in WiMAX, we have an outer code which is a read settlement code and an inner code which is a convolutional encoder to provide forward error correct encoding. Now, as we add redundancy, then we have to consider the factor C sub R, which is the coding rate. For example, with convolutional encoder, for every one bit that we input, we output two bits, so the coding rate is equal to a half. And in that case, with every six bits that's associated with a point in the constellation, only three bits carry data. The other three bits are redundant bits in order to provide forward error correct encoding. So that's what C sub R tells us, which is the coding rate. Also, we have things like puncturing and shortening going on. Puncturing in the case of convolutional encoding and shortening in, in the case of read settlement encoding. So the overall coding rate is of importance. So C sub R is the overall coding rate. And sometimes when the signal noise ratio is large enough, we can actually throw away some of the redundant bits and get a higher bit rate. And the way we do that is to use a coding rate which is larger than, for example, a half. Like, for example, in 802.11a, the coding rate at the highest bit rate of 54 megabits per second is 3 and a quarter. So, for example, we will use C sub R equal to 3 and a quarter. That would be the coding rate. Times the number of bits per constellation point gives you the actual data bits per constellation point times the number of carriers, which represents each constellation point. That gives you the total number of data bits within each OFDM symbol. We take that and divide it by the duration of the OFDM symbol and we get the bit rate. So the table here shows how the bit rate changes when we change the cyclic prefix, the size of the cyclic prefix. For example, in the case of 802.11a, we have a cyclic prefix which is 16 samples long. The OFDM symbol is 80 samples long. 64 samples are T sub B, the useful data part. In this case, we have 800 nanoseconds for the 
guard interval or cyclic prefix, which is the 16 samples. And if we consider the case where we have a data rate of 54 megabits per second, in that case, we have 64 QAM. So B sub M equals 6 bits per constellation point. The coding rate is 3 and a quarter, and there are 48 carriers carrying data. So N sub data is equal to 48. If we plug these numbers back into this formula here, and we use T sub S, which is equal to the 64 samples plus 16 samples for the cyclic prefix, which is equal to 80 samples. We compute T sub S with the knowledge that the sampling rate is 20 megahertz. So you can actually compute what T sub S is, which is actually 4 microseconds. Then we get the data rate, which turns out to be 54 megabits per second. So this is per 11A specification. Now if we shorten the cyclic prefix by a half and use only eight samples, then that will reduce T sub S, and if we reduce T sub S, we increase the data rate. So use the same numbers as before, 48 data carriers, three and a quarter coding rate, six bits per constellation point for 64 QAM, and we get that the data rate is equal to 60 megabits per second. So by shortening the cyclic prefix, we have improved the data rate quite a bit from 54 megabits to 60 megabits per second. Now this can be done in the case, for example, where we're working in a confined environment where the RMS delay spread is small. Then we can actually maybe switch into a mode where we use half the size for the cyclic prefix and then we can improve overall throughput. This is actually used as an option in 802.11n. Now suppose that we wanted to extend 802.11a to an outdoors environment, in which case in an outdoors environment the RMS delay spread will exceed three or four hundred nanoseconds easily and therefore in order to avoid intersymbol interference we need to enlarge the cyclic prefix. So in this case we might double the cyclic prefix going from 16 samples to 32 samples. In this case the guard interval is 1.6 microseconds which provides adequate protection in an outdoors environment provided that the RMS delay spread doesn't exceed for example one microsecond. So you still have to be careful because in many outdoor environments the actual RMS delay spread can easily exceed two or three microseconds. But in a dense urban environment we might, might expect it to be such that doubling the cyclic prefix provides us with enough protection but the price is that the data rate went from 54 megabits per second down to 45 megabits per second. So you pay a price for gaining more protection against intersymbol interference when you have a larger RMS delay spread. In order to determine the effect of reducing or increasing the cyclic prefix on the overall data rate in the OFDM system. Now it's interesting to point out that in 802.16a and also in WiMAX there's a provision to support four different sizes for the cyclic prefix and the base station can actually adjust the cyclic prefix based on the environment in order to obtain the maximum throughput for the subscriber stations where you can take advantage of smaller RMS delay spreads or when the RMS delay spread is large you actually use a larger cyclic prefix in order to protect against intersymbol interference at the cost of throughput. The original paper that introduced the cyclic prefix for OFDM was published in August of 1989 uh, by the authors shown here in an article entitled The Digital Sound Broadcasting to Mobile Receivers and the IEEE Transaction on Consumer Electronics. And this of course was a big breakthrough in terms of combating intersymbol interference and reducing the hardware requirements for OFDM considerably. Now here we show the actual diagram that was used in that paper illustrating the guard interval for an OFDM symbol.